Good morning, all. I'm Alicia Buss, host of Horsepower Empowerment Through Connection. And today we have a very special guest, Shannon Knapp from Horse Sense of the Carolinas in Marshall, North Carolina. Now, Shannon and I have kind of a fun history. So when I was going to Prescott College over in Prescott, Arizona, Shannon came over and was teaching us for one of our intensives. And then later on in life, I was teaching at a Waldorf school over in Asheville, North Carolina, and Shannon was kind enough to let me come up and volunteer at her program. So I've had the great honor of getting to see the amazing things that she does at her program firsthand. So Shannon has an incredibly diverse life story and does all sorts of really incredible things on her program. And she's going to dive a little bit more into the science of what we do in equine assisted learning and mental health. Um, so Shannon, thank you again so much for getting to be here on the show today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really looking forward to being here and uh, sharing whatever I can that might be of benefit to others. You're very welcome. So can you tell us really quickly, just give a broad overview of the populations you serve and some of the um, different specialties in, that you have at your place? Well, we've been in existence since 2003. So there's very few clients that we haven't seen, very few diagnoses. Our very first client uh, was uh, literally dissociative identity disorder, which wow. is not a recommended starting point for most folks that are just getting started. Uh, yeah. But nonetheless, that's what we had, right? We work with what shows up. That's right. uh, we spent a lot of time working with uh, juvenile justice and incarcerated youth and gang involved youth um, and uh, did that for about five years, worked for more than 10 years with outpatient juvenile justice, i.e. not incarcerated youth. A uh, lot of addiction and recovery, a lot of grief and loss, uh, communication, family, relationships depression and anxiety, uh, and of course, uh, underlying most of all of that is trauma and PTSD. Yeah. So we now have a, a, a vigorous program for veterans and first responders and their families. We have another uh, uh, program specifically for working with uh, younger kids, so mainly like middle school and sometimes younger than that. But um, after our work uh, with the gang involved and incarcerated youth, and we were really successful with that, um, uh, we had the crazy idea of why don't we try and get them before something bad happens to them and they get locked up. So we kept going yeah. younger and younger and younger uh, to the point now where our mo many of our groups are, our youth groups are between uh, six to 10 years old. Uh, sometimes younger than that. We've had some adorable kids this summer. Uh, even in the midst of COVID, we've been able to, just the past three weeks, we've had a bunch of our youth groups. So it, that's, we've that's generally so worked great. with this all. <laughs> yeah, and I know you've been having just like really great protocols um, for how you're properly handling COVID and all that with masks and social distancing. Um, would you like to tell our audience a little bit more about how you've been navigating all that with COVID? Well, uh, we've mainly been putting everything that we do, we've been sharing with anyone who uh, is interested in our procedures and protocols. Uh, there's a website, uh, Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com forward slash Trailblazers Uncensored. And when you go to that site, patreon.com forward slash uh, Trailblazers Uncensored, there's a little button that says COVID-19. And there's 25 posts of all of our disinfectants and our protocols and video walkthrough of our office about what we're doing. Uh, just a, 101 things because it, it's an ever moving target. So folks yeah. are more than welcome to take advantage of the work that we've done that may be a fit for them or it may be a jumping off point for them creating their own safety and health protocols. That's so excellent. Thank you so much, Shannon. And Shannon's been um, doing weekly calls for a while during COVID that I've had the great pleasure of getting to be on, as well as many of the other equine professionals in the field. She's now gone to um, bi-monthly calls um, for that, which has continued to be really helpful for myself and other people as we navigate this time. And she's brought some really great speakers on. Um, she had, uh, oh, I'm so sorry, I'm forgetting the name of the lovely young woman that came on when um, the protests were happening. Um, Elizabeth Corby? Yes, and so you had a chance to talk about your, how you were responding and trying to help your community navigate the, what was going on with the protests. Yeah, most definitely. So we've had uh, Elizabeth on and we're getting ready to have Veronica Lack, who is another wonderful uh, equine assisted therapy practitioner and teacher uh, with The Herd. Uh, she's also a person of color and she and I have been having some great uh, conversations and discussions around 
uh, how to respond to uh, Black Lives Matter and social justice movements and the, um, the trauma of race and race related trauma. Uh, we're also, I've been running and will continue to run over time more and more white fragility reading groups. Uh, you know, so white people when confronted with a challenge have committees and reading groups. And so this is our contribution uh, to that. Uh, I come from a long line of, uh, prior to equine assisted psychotherapy and learning, I was in my master's program uh, specializing in uh, the writings of women of color and the women writers of color of the diaspora, so Africa and the Caribbean and the United States. So this is uh, kind of in my blood and I absolutely uh, uh, love, love, love having this conversation uh, with as many people who want to. Thank you so much for that contribution to the community and being able to take it really worldwide since anybody can be online yeah. these days and get to be part of the group. So that's a really important thing that you're bringing. So thank you. Excellent. Um, and isn't Veronica uh, going to be on the Herd Summit? Isn't that this Saturday? Yeah. Is she uh, one of the speakers? So Veronica is the founder and director of the Herd Institute. And her virtual conference, which was supposed to be in person, her virtual conference will be this Saturday, the 11th. Yeah. Uh, which is super exciting. Jake LaRue and I were originally going to speak on uh, equine assisted therapy with first responders. And uh, as I said, I called Veronica a couple of weeks ago and said, we can't, we can't talk about that. We can't talk about that without talking about what's going on in the world. So that particular presentation morphed into a conversation about veterans, first responders, Black Lives Matter, and equine assisted psychotherapy and learning between me and Jake and Veronica. It's a, it was a it was a great, great conversation and a jumping off point. So rich content for those who are interested, which I think we all are. Uh, yeah, are absolutely. In having those conversations. So yeah, that's this Saturday. And actually, Veronica is my guest for uh, July 13th for the webinar uh, for the 13th. Excellent. I'm really excited about all of that. I totally blocked off my Saturday schedule so I can just get up wicked early and <laughs> be online glued to my computer for the entire Herd Summit. Yeah. Um, that's just so great. Uh, also, don't you work with something called the M-Wave with heart math to like measure congruence and for some of the science backing for the work that you do? Yeah, absolutely. And we're not unique. Uh, there are a lot of other programs that are using it and it's, it's really exciting. Okay, so, yeah. you know, what, what we do is relatively soft, right? We can create testing instruments like Beck Depression and, you know, GAD7 and all those sorts of things to measure uh, pre and post effectiveness. And we've been doing that since inception. Um, one of the nice things about the N-Wave in particular, though, is that it's measuring um, physiology and, it, it, and it's telling us, so basically M-Wave is measuring the length of the inhale versus the length of the exhale. So if you know anything about the sympathetic parasympathetic system, you know that when you have a super long inhale and a short exhale, it uh, brings the system down. And when you reverse that, it jacks the system up. When your inhale and exhale are equal in length, uh, then we say the system is con congruent or coherent, whichever you choose. Coherent is the language of M-Wave and heart map. So through um, a little clip on your ear or through a sensor on your finger, you can measure those things. And we've been measuring them with our kiddos. We've been measuring them with our individual clients uh, for years now. Now we just need some wonderful um, grad student to come help uh, dissect and write up all of this research that we've been doing. I'm sure there's somebody out there that's really- I sure hope so. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. And we maybe they'll get, to, they'll get to see this video and be like, oh my God, yes, that's exactly what I needed for like my dissertation. <laughs> Absolutely, I'll totally like dial that in. Um, for people, for our viewers that don't know what the parasympathetic nervous system is and the sympathetic, could you just break that down really quickly? So, Well, so sympathetic, parasympathetic, uh, sympathetic, uh, drops the anxiety in it for layman's terms layman's terms <laughs> sympathetic is uh the brakes and the parasympathetic is the gas pedal or the alarm um the parasympathetic is the alarm the smoke alarm in your brain that says danger will robinson and yeah only quite a different like. age to know the will robinson reference but that tells you how old i am and we won't talk about that <laughs> i know what you're talking about <laughs> yeah, okay. all right, all right. So. <laughs> um, yeah, I love that M-Wave is becoming more and more um, popular um, to get to work with with research. And there's actually, I feel like there's more and more research coming out in our field 
you know, like when I wrote my thesis in 2012, there's still, um, it was lacking in some areas. Like we're still, there was more in the mental health aspect of things and less in the EAL, so the equine assisted learning. Yeah. Um, for people that don't quite understand the boundaries of those two things, could you um, explain the difference between equine assisted learning and mental health? Well, so the way that I, I'm a, I like to have visual references, that helps me a lot. Um, uh, one of the ways that I like to look at it is that equine assisted therapy, we're going down the rabbit hole with the client wherever the client takes us. And then in an equine assisted learning, we have a, a set criteria of things that we're gonna be focusing on. And although we may see signs or uh, flags that point us in particular directions with particular clients, we're gonna, um, uh, refer those clients to the appropriate resources and stay on top on topic with what it is that we're tasked to do. It's really a discussion about scope of practice and what is your scope of practice. Right. Uh, what are you engaging with the client to do mm -hmm. and not stepping beyond that. Uh, so, uh, you know, if a client in an individual session were to indicate something about abuse that had not been previously reported, we're going to have conversations about that. If uh, an after school group were here talking about issues of abuse, we're going to stay on topic with why that group is here at the farm, which may be, you know, communication or a sort of communicate, whatever it might be. Um, and then we're going to notify the appropriate staff around that child that this is happening and that something needs to happen. And of course, we'll offer individual therapy. We do a lot of individual therapy with our kiddos that come in group. Well, when it's indicated, we will spin them out and do a series of it, spin them out of the group. <laughs> sounds, sounds bad. Um, we'll spin <laughs> them out of the group and put them into individual therapy so that we can have a little one-on-one -on -one time around that particular issue. So just understanding what it is that you're agreeing to do with the client and not, um, uh, equine assisted learning is not therapy light is the kind of the big take home message. And I think that, can be confusing for folks when they first get into the field because it isn't always a hard and clear line. Right. We, the farm never work without a mental health professional. So we're always having that piece as part of the work that we're doing. And we are almost always working with um, compromised populations yeah. who we're expecting to have uh, uh, more challenges in front of them than, than your average uh, client. So we always practice with a mental health professional. Just our, it's our standard operating procedure. Right. And I, um, I remember when I was there that you used to have kids that you would break them into groups and they would do their homework after school for part of the time. Yep. And you'd have the heart math um, with M wave. And then you'd also have them doing mounted and groundwork. Is that still? Oh yeah. 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 It changes based on who's in front of us. And of course sure. this particular uh, summer has been completely off the hook because it's of COVID. What? That's uh, so weird. <laughs> well, it, uh, well, it's not. I mean, when you think about I'm it. I'm, I'm teasing oh, you, Chad. Oh, I was, okay. I was totally I mean, it's like, Well, no, you know. One. <laughs> um, so, yeah, between that and uh, between COVID and the protests and being at home, um, we, our, our youth groups, whom you remember, Alicia, from being here on site, when yeah. they finally went back to being active and meeting, uh, the one thing that they have done as a group outside of the center is to come to the farm. So we had three weeks in a row, Monday through Friday, uh, gr a group every day, and some groups, uh, some days, two, day, two groups a day. So mm -hmm. it has been completely full, full, full. Uh, with uh, and the kids are carrying a lot. I mean, we're all oh, carrying yeah. a lot, but the kids are carrying it too. And to pretend that they're yes. not is, you know, really just missing the boat. You know, so so yeah, it's been it's been crazy. Yeah. What are some of the things that you've seen coming up the most with um, COVID and the protests, like in the different populations that you've been working with? Um, I just uh, free floating anxiety, uh, anxiety for our kiddos, um, insecure. Uh, uh, you know, lack of certainty, and of course, basic needs, right? Yeah. So we've had more kiddos showing up uh, that we're not entirely sure what they're eating and if they're mm -hmm. eating. And of course, we have a policy that our partners always feed the kids on their way to the farm. And if they don't feed them, they let us know so that we can feed them. Um, yeah. Because we know that 
you know, school lunches ain't happening because they're haven't, and they haven't for a while. And yeah. many of the kiddos that we're working with are eligible for those types of programs. And so, um, just a, a heightened anxiety uh, across the board, I would say. Mm. That totally makes sense. And remind me, Shannon, are you guys a nonprofit or a for-profit over there? So Horse Sense of the Carolinas is a for-profit, air quotes around for-profit. Nobody's retiring anytime soon. I if you want to make money, do something else. <laughs> um, but if you want to make a difference, do this. Um, yeah. So uh, Horse Sense of the Carolinas is a for-profit since 2003. In 2014, we started a nonprofit sister organization that specifically uh, funds at-risk youth and veterans and first responders Beautiful. Uh, and funds multiple organizations, of which Horse Sense is one of them, but other uh, guests that you've had have applied um, for the funding here. But it's specific to Western North Carolina. We don't fund out of this region because we do site visits and we want to be able to keep tabs on the horses and make sure that yet another nonprofit hasn't started up saying, let's get a bunch of rescue horses and help people and then not do right by any of them and create a, a bad impression of the field in the general public. I can appreciate that to be certain. Um, speaking of all of that, what is, what are some of the models that inform your work? Um, so I am seriously eclectic and I've studied with about anybody. Well, I say that and then I remember that uh, uh, Sarah Schlotti has compiled a list. There's over like 150 trainings and certifications uh, internationally these it's days. It's pretty amazing. Yeah. <laughs> I've probably trained with about, you know, maybe 10, 15 of the originals. And by originals, I mean like a gala and path. Um, some uh, Epona, the women who wrote Horse Sense and the Human Heart, the McCormicks at Trace Egalis. I um, have that book. <laughs> uh, okay, yeah, okay, Corral, Greg Person. So all of those folks, I studied with all of them and continue to stay uh, deeply informed about everything. Uh, natural lifemanship is probably the model that is uh, close or the program that is closest to uh, philosophically and uh, in, in terms of actual delivery, both theory and practice. So I'm a theory and practice gal, got to have a good solid theory behind it. And it's also got to work in practice because having a good foundation in one doesn't mean you've got a foundation in the other. And to me, it's got to be good in both. Um, so natural lifemanship is the uh, only program that I've uh, become a trainer for. And because because uh, I completely and wholeheartedly believe in it. So natural lifemanship has been around since then. I've known Tim and Bettina since way back when we all first got started in the field. And we've been colleagues and friends for a number of years. And then when they started the natural lifemanship uh, program, uh, I was totally on board. So uh, delighted to, to do that. I, I'm interested in good theory and good practice, though, in, in whatever forms. That's, that's fantastic. So what is it about the theory and practice of natural life mentorship that really draws you and indicates to you? Well, there's hard science behind it. It pays attention to how trauma impacts the brain. Um, I know that for many years I was frustrated trying to draw metaphors out of clients who were clearly in lower regions of their brain and unable to process the kinds of questions that I was asking. And I wanted a, a an approach that more completely and clearly understood the lower regions of the brain and how to integrate the horse into that process um, because I knew it was possible we'd been doing it um, but the models that I was looking at did not uh, did not reflect that so the science is there the understanding of uh, how trauma impacts the brain and understanding of the brain at all uh, yeah. is really foundational and it's also um, relational so uh, the horse, I, I know that there's all sorts of um, uh, drama around the use of the word tool. I know that a lot of people use the word tool uh, in ways that I don't agree with. And a lot of people use the word tool in the same way that, you know, make me an instrument of thy peace is an instrument, you know, that I'm a tool. So I don't have quite the, the hang up about the word tool, although I don't use it. Uh, so the horse is much more than a tool. The horse is much more than a mirror. Um, uh, there are plenty of websites and folks out there. Yeah, right. Thanks. There you go. More than a mirror. More than a mirror. Uh, this is the book that Shannon wrote, one of many, I think. And <laughs> it's a fantastic book. I just recently uh, promoted it to uh, a couple different people. And she's got right. 
skill, skill cards? Do you have skill cards to go with this particular book? Uh, or no, is that just for cards are, in general? Skill cards are separate. Yeah, skill cards are a separate uh, um, program. We developed the skill cards specifically in reference to our gang involved and incarcerated youth program, and it sprung up out of that. Um, but uh, yeah, the, the, uh, there's so many websites and so many professionals out there that say the horse mirrors us. And I really take issue with that because then it gets to be yet another reflection of me and it gets to be all about me yet again. Um, the horse is responding to similarities and to patterns of behavior, but I, I, I'm very much against the idea that the horse is mirroring us. Um, and uh, natural lifemanship doesn't suggest anything. It recognizes the science behind, uh, I have a series of patterns of behavior and the horse is responding to those, not mirroring me. Yeah, and don't they talk a lot about attachment theory? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, recognizing secure attachment and insecure attachment and, and all of those things, uh, uh, those are basic healthy connected relationship skills. And if you've got a good relationship with your horse, uh, you hopefully have the ability to recognize why that is and help others develop those same um, muscles to build healthy connected attachments. Yeah, I recently found this really great book. I've, have you seen this book, Shannon? Yeah, it's, it's got a attached. glare on it, but yeah. Sorry, yeah. Uh, attached is a, a really great book that talks about attachment theory for people that want to learn more about attachment theory in general. And then you should definitely research natural lifemanship. I too am a giant fan of natural lifemanship, but I'm just like, everybody go check that one out. But I mean, every model, I love how, you know, everybody has their different storyline in life and what meets them at different points in their developmental process. And you're going to be pulled into different providers and different models that meet you. Um, well, and I think the key thing is, is that regardless of the model, um, why are people doing what they're doing? Yeah. Why do they think it is better or more effective than another model? I'm, I'm just interested, right? Why, why is this a better way to treat this population with this issue than this is? And, mm -hmm. I, I, and then I'm open. I'm like, yeah. tell me, bring it. I want to hear because I want to know. I don't believe there's only one way, right? There's more than one way to get the job done. And I'm interested in the rationale behind the many different models that are now out there. I love that you bring that point up, which um, brings me to another question for you, which is what is your why for what it, you do? Like what drives you to, like, to work with horses that brought you into the field initially? Like, what, you got, what got you here today? Well, so that changed. Um, I mean, I've been doing it for a super long time. So if your why doesn't change and evolve, then you go out of business. So the why that brought me to the door is not the why that keeps me here. Sure. And the why of three years ago is not the why for now. The why for right now is very much about uh, the immediate demonstrable impact of this work on some of our most um, challenged populations. Uh, being able to hear immediate reports of immediate impact and long-term impact of the work that we're doing on some of our kiddos and with some of our veterans. I remember thinking of, uh, we, we've had to uh, postpone all of our veterans immersion retreats so far this year. And those are some of the most wonderful things that, that I've ever been a part of. One of our veterans at one of those um, uh, immersions a couple of years ago was on the verge of losing his leg. Uh, was homeless, was, uh, you know, struggling with chemical dependency. And after spending, you know, some time with us in the immersion, and then he was also local, so he spent more time with us. You know, something as simple as being able to sleep through the night or at least sleep longer mm -hmm. than yeah. I used to, right? Uh, how you can, I can't put a price tag on that. And I can see it in people's eyes right? The, this release, this relaxation of anxiety and stress and this feeling of being felt. And that's what the horses bring. Because even at my best, I'm not able to inhabit and real, I, I'm human, right? I'm, I'm, I'm as limited as I, as I am human. And I've got my own story and my biases and my own agenda, even at my best. And even if I want to be helpful, I've got all of that noise getting in the way of yeah. me being able to really feel with another person. 
now we go to great lengths not to, to have all that stuff removed as barriers to us connecting. But nonetheless, those barriers are still there. They're not there to the degree that they are with horses. And, mm. you know, God bless them uh, that horses hear us. And they're, they're the model that I strive for in clean listening, really. Active listening, clean listening, um, and, and connection, just being heard. Right? Yeah. No, that's a really beautiful thing. Uh, speaking of stories, could you share a couple of really profound stories, things that you've seen people like transcend their experiences with the veterans, with the kids? Um, yeah. So like uh, one of my earliest stories is that one of the very first kids that we ever worked with from the um, juvenile, uh, the gang violence prevention program, the incarcerated youth, um, this young man had the kind of background and history and trauma that you read about in the paper and you're stunned that they're even upright and breathing. I mean, like the fact that they haven't, you know, killed everyone in their path and themselves is nothing short of astonishing given the systemic and outrageous amounts of abuse that they yeah. have suffered. Um, and he was one of the very first kids that we worked with from the local lockdown facility. And uh, he, <laughs> um, the story I'd like to tell about, about him, he was working with our mayors. And, and in fact, it just dawned on me that we just lost the horse that I'm telling this story about um, last week. So, so um, this is in honor and in memory of uh, Sugar. Um, he was working with the mayors. And Sugar, was, one of the things that we do a lot is uh, introductions and meet and greet. And he was introducing himself to the four horses in the pasture. And he would go up to each horse and he would say hello and connect or however he, you know, whatever it, he wanted it to look like is what he did. And every time he tried to connect with this particular horse, Sugar, she would duck behind another horse and then look out from behind a butt. And then he'd go around that side and he and Sugar would go over here and look out from the other side. So she was always kind of at some distance, interested but anxious about uh, connecting. And uh, we were, so gosh, you know, that's interesting. You've, you've, you've uh, met each of the other three, and then what's going on with this, this one, this, this one here? And he said, um, she's my heart. No one's gonna get too close. Um. And so the rest of his, tree, so that's, the, there we go. That's what we're working on for the rest of our time together is, how do we help her learn how to connect, learn when it's safe to connect, whom it's safe to connect with? And then when, when I have to go back out into quote unquote the real world, how do I put the armor back on? And that was, that was the rest of his treatment was making those decisions for himself because not making connection is no way to live. And mm -hmm. he acknowledged that. And so we spent the rest of the time doing that. And in his very last session with us, where he had done, he did amazing, outrageous work. Really, really good, hard, digging in work. Um, and our last session with him, we said, you know, you've done, you've done everything. You've been amazing. What would you like to do to close out your time with us? And his request was, we're going to take a couple flakes of hay and go into the pasture and put the hay out in the manger and just hang out in the manger with the horses and listen to them munch hay. Now, anyone who knows anything about regulation in the brain knows that that's rhythmic pattern, repetitive uh, sensory input that's organizing a traumatized brain and it's incredibly soothing, right? Yeah, um, absolutely. And so that was our last session together in which he also, uh, his, help, his job during that session, his assignment, was to tell us a day in the life of 20 years from now. So where are you waking up? Who are you having breakfast with? What kind of job do you have? Who are, you know, what's in your world? What are you doing? And he told us about the life that he wanted to live and who he wanted to be while we sat there in the hay manger. I mean, that, that's one of the most amazing stories that I've ever been a part of. And of course he was locked up for good reason. He'd done some really bad things, right? Mm -hmm. um, explanations don't get us out of our consequences and he uh, was he was amazing and so I mean that's one example another example of some of our um, uh, kiddos we had uh, one little girl who was seven years old who 
in a very first meeting would say things like those horses are bad they need to be beaten uh, you know it's bad horses um i just want to die i mean li this was oh, the wow. kind of stuff that was coming out of her mouth just in passing right and they had the weight behind them of real meaning and, and even if a kid were joking about such a thing like that you know that all of our alarm bells would go off sure. right so um so this uh, little girl and her brother and her older sister came out to the farm, um, spun out from one of our youth groups and did some individual therapy with us. And by the end of a series of individual therapy, which by, we, all we had the opportunity for was like three sessions, we often open our youth groups, uh, especially this family group with a small circle, kind of a check-in circle. And I could see as we were doing this little check-in circle, this little seven-year-old girl, get that look in her eyes. And by that look, I mean a good look where I could tell she was about to launch and she ran smiling and threw herself into my arms and we did the swing, right? You know, when a kid throws themselves into your arms and you swing them around, right? A normal seven-year-old action. And she yeah. was doing that by the end of our treatment together. And she's now one of the leaders in her classroom, according to her teachers, you know, and she gave her teacher, oh my God, this is such a great, unbelievable story. So her horse was a horse named Lucky. And he was a, um, an all black horse on our farm that came from a horrible rescue background. Um, and at the end of their time, we'll often give our kiddos little stuffed animals that represent the horse that they connected with, either at the beginning of their treatment so that they can stay, you know, an attachment object, right? It, um, uh, so she had one of those. And at the end of her semester class last year, she gave her little lucky horse to her teacher because she thought that her teacher needed the lucky connection and attachment more than she did at that mm. point. And so then that teacher came to the farm and identified Lucky based on the little stuffed animal. I mean, so, I mean, it's so incredibly making a difference and making a big difference it is, it is and can be really, really easy, Yeah. right? It can be really easy. It can be really simple. And at its best, it really is uh, simple. Um, so those are a couple of things. And uh, the veteran that I was talking about before who almost lost his leg and, and uh, fought like a trooper to keep his leg, to keep his life, uh, to not give up, to um, overcome addiction to the degree that anybody overcomes addiction. Um, right. Yeah, I mean, I've got tons of them. I don't know how much time you got. <laughs> <laughs> we love to hear good stories about how working with horses has changed people's lives. Um, don't you also um, offer respite right now? Yeah. So uh, the respite sessions are one off, not mental health, but we do have a mental health professional present uh, for our uh, essential workers. And we've been hearing from nurses and emergency room docs and, and docs and um, all, all kinds of folks about needing a little extra um, help and support right now. As, as So has, do we all really? Right. So what would you say one of your respite uh, sessions looks like to just give people kind of a frame of reference? Well, it's uh, as I think probably the best outline of what we do in a respite session is written up in more than a mirror. Um, the, I talk about observation and meet and greet. Those are standards for us that we're doing uh, uh, at the beginning of almost every session, almost every time. Uh, so an observation session, observing a couple of horses, how do they communicate, what do they communicate, uh, and then meet and greet, introduce yourself to these horses in whatever way feels comfortable um, with an intent to learn something more about them and let them learn something more about you. So that would be an entire respite session. Uh, right there, we might do it at the labyrinth. We might do it in a pasture. We might. Are there any number of places we could do it where we're getting an incredible amount of sensory input? Uh, if not the sensory input, most obviously of the horse, right there, <laughs> the horse, right there. And Shannon, how large is your facility again? Like it's a beautiful place in the hills of North Carolina. But uh, well, there's 100, 110 acres, and at any given time, 25 horses is a good guess. 
Uh, we had, we started out and continue to work a lot with rescue rehab horses. And I mentioned uh, Lucky and his rescue rehab background, pretty horrific. And, and Sugar as well, the one that we just lost and we're waiting for autopsy results on right now. Um, she was also a seizure in our county. So um, yeah, our commitment is, we, when we started this, we started out working primarily to support rescue rehab horses. And then I realized in the process of working with these horses, how much good it was doing for me and for all the people around me and that came in contact with the work that we did, which was the jumping off point for starting Horse Sense of the Carolinas. That's really cool. And you use the Pirelli model of natural horsemanship, isn't that correct? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Pirelli has a, a wonderful standardized system. Now, systems aren't for everybody, but they are for, you know, mere mortals like me. I, I, need, a, I need a plan. I need a <laughs> to follow um, because I can, get, I can get lost. I can get tangential really quickly and lose my focus. So uh, the Pirelli system, I found at about the same time that I found equine assisted psychotherapy and learning. And to me, the systems are very much hand in glove, um, that, that they're very simpatico. So yeah, we're, um, I've spent a lot of time in the Pirelli ranches in Colorado and Florida, as has my husband, uh, and absolutely a, a big fan of natural horsemanship in general and Pirelli in specific. That's really cool. Didn't uh, one of your employees, Jake LaRue, who he's your, one of your equine specialists, is that right? Uh -huh. Didn't he just recently speak at one of the Pirelli events? Am I yeah, remembering so, that correctly? Uh, yeah, absolutely. The Pirelli Foundation, which is the nonprofit arm of Pirelli that I was, that, that I and a couple of other folks were a part of making happen, super proud of that. Um, so, so the Pirellis good. have always had passion for uh, rescue horses and and uh, equine assisted therapy and learning and for, and for youth. So the Pirelli Foundation in specific supports those three branches. Um, so youth, rescue horses, and therapeutic programming with horses. And Jake spoke at a, a, um, a fundraiser they had uh, last year about our work with um, veterans. They funded us for some of our veteran work. That's really cool, because he is a veteran. Oh yeah, 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 he's a Marine Corps veteran. And my husband's an Air Force veteran, so it's just nothing but sniping. It's great fun. It's entertaining. <laughs> That's wonderful. Um, there's just so much, so much going on over at your place. Like it's really, <laughs> it's really cool. And then you have a bunch of curriculum that you've written as well. Isn't that correct? You have the Mustang work. And could you talk a little bit more about how you yeah. created that and provide it for the equine professionals? Well, and for mental health professionals as well, for anybody in the field. Um, so running with Mustangs was the curriculum that we developed and for which we developed the skill cards. Uh, running with Mustangs, literally, uh, we have completely revised it. And there's a 2020 edition that's coming out this week. So Isn't I'm that funny how that comes together? <laughs> right? So, well, it was, it was only due in March. I mean, we're only a couple of months behind, right? So, you know, with uh, everything going on, I think that's actually still pretty good. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm feeling it. Um, so <laughs> running with Mustangs is specifically the, uh, the curriculum that we developed through working with incarcerated and gang-involved youth. It has four components to it. It's got our basically uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, our skill cards for working with the kids. Um, and I say kids, they're, you know, like 15, 13 to 15. Uh, there is a vocational component. So talking about if this is something that works for you, how do you stay connected and plugged into hanging out with horses? There is um, a natural horsemanship component to it. And there's also a spoken word poetry component to it. And oh, we, that was one of the most amazing things that we've ever been a part of. And all of the poetry that the boys created as a result of that program uh, is now in this new manual. That's something oh, that's that, so that wasn't cool. in the previous manual that is in this manual. So I'm delighted to give voice to all of these guys and all of their poems, including the young man whom I was telling us cool. about. Um, so that is just coming out now. We've also written curriculums around working with eating disorders. Uh, we've written what I call activity guides. Uh, and activity guides and curriculums differ in that activity guides are week one, we do this, week two, we do this. 
uh, whereas curriculums have a lit review, best practices, it's a lot more comprehensive and more turnkey curriculum. It does include week one, we do this, week two, we do that, but there's a lot more underneath it that undergirds the work that we're doing. And we take a look at best practices with that diagnosis, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we're also, uh, the next thing that we're about to finish or I'm about to finish is a brand new policies and procedures. Our last policies and procedures was from around 2012 and uh, a lot has shifted since then. Oh, yeah. um, we stepped into <laughs> a whole other level of operational um, uh, operations. So our policies and procedures is reflecting that. So we're adding uh, the, all the requests that I get regularly for you know, this document and that document and a sample of this contract and all that stuff. It's all in there. And uh, I'm, I'm grateful to, to get it out there and to help other people because, gosh, you know, this stuff can be uh, not exactly all that sexy. Um, it can be mind-numbingly boring. And, yeah. and yet, if we don't do it, we don't live long enough to keep helping clients. Um, and that I think, is the challenge. So yeah. the curriculums um, and then the skill cards, uh, all sorts of different things. So... Uh, and now uh, the biggest thing that we've got going on is Trailblazers Uncensored. So, I was just going to bring that up. Yeah, that's really exciting. So I'd love for you to talk more about that because I think it's really helpful, especially for people who have been struggling to get their equine practices online and getting to have more guidance in that process. Um, and then, yeah, there's just so much to unpack right there. Um, yeah. Do you have any online courses on top of that for the Trailblazers? Uh, we do. Uh, they are being rolled out. And the biggest thing that Trailblazers offers folks right now is uh, access um, to me helping them develop their program. Um, the Trailblazers is a membership program. We had Trailblazers. We started it back in like 2010, I want to yeah. say. And uh, the, the technology wasn't there to do what we wanted it to do. It was good, but it wasn't yeah. great. Um, and now we've uh, revamped it and it just came out in April of this year. Um, but there's a lot of, I, I'm able to share with folks in real time as fast as it hits me, what's going on in my head and things that I think are important to folks in their programs. The webinars, the um, weekly webinars and now um, twice monthly webinars that we've been doing are my commitment to raise the level of professionalism in the field. Information for anyone, everyone, free, right? Yeah, great. And then Trailblazers, uh, the membership platforms, uh, get deeper and deeper into more specific support for you and your business, more uh, support around the populations that you're working with, um, more help with your uh, passive revenue streams, uh, with your online teaching, with your curriculum development, because the only reason that I've written these, we've written these curriculums is that we've been around this long yeah, and really almost, information. almost immediately, you know, my challenge to everyone listening to this is become an expert in a population, become an expert in a diagnosis, become an expert in something that you're passionate about and write it out and share it with the rest of us. It's not a lockstep that we all have to follow the method. It's yeah. information to deepen and enrich the conversation for all of us and to make us better professionals with the variety of diagnosis that we come in contact with. I don't have time to be a professional. I mean, an expert in every single diagnosis that we work with, but collectively we can. And if I help support folks write those curriculums and get those out to the broader equine assisted therapy and learning community, um, then that's a ripple effect that I'm really, really happy about. So Trailblazers is about that, is about creating sanity and um, sustainability, right? Because you can go insane very quickly and still not be sustainable. And you can be sustainable and be absolutely insane, right? Without amount. And I know this because we've done it all. We've done both of those. Oh, yeah. No, I can well imagine over that period of time. I mean, every new business has their struggles. I mean, yeah. like, even if you've been in business for a long time, different things happen. I mean, like, then we could, like, we didn't predict COVID and now we've all had to, you know, like hop to and really like stretch our imaginations and work in collaboration with each other to try and navigate like these new things. And, um, 
it's just, I so appreciate your message and how you're trying to serve our, our community. And um, I love that you and I are like kind of in a similar like journey in that regard and trying to get the visibility out there and trying to collaborate and understanding that like, there's so, there's so many people out there that we need to help. And it, we want to go deep as well as like wide in the way that we do that is being able to honor that each of us has something different that we get to bring to the table yeah. Um, yeah. to help the um, collective consciousness. And yeah, it's just, I don't know if I, my, lots of people, you haven't, it's, our, the diagnosis book is, it's like so big. It's so big. And pick like how many different things, that, I, I forget the name of it. Uh, I'm the sure DSM. Thank you, the DSM. I'm like, I haven't looked at the paper copy in a while. And as massage therapists, you know, sometimes we have to go back and look at like all what they, we get an interesting <laughs> code floating through every once in a while on prescriptions. And we're like, what is that? And then we get to do our research too. Um, but it's, there's so many different things. Go ahead. Actually, I, I forgot um, that we do the online courses. We, we tend to not, um, we haven't done much of the, here's a block of an online course that you can do without any contact uh, with us. I find that contact with us is actually pretty important for real. So I, I, I'm not a, not a huge fan of putting a course in a can and then having that just roll out year after year after year. Cause I think it's, I don't, I don't know that it's that um, cannibal as it were. It's a 20% uh, success rate of like a, uh, is, is what I heard is that um, when there's a canned product that um, people only actually implement about 20% of it and make it all the way through. Yeah, yeah. The courses that we do offer though, um, I offer one in conjunction with Bettina uh, at Natural Lifemanship where it's the business building masterclass and it's about six months long and it's uh, lots and lots and lots of time with Bettina and I. Nice. Um, getting getting really into the nitty gritty of running one of these businesses. Uh, that's one course that we offer throughout the year. And another course that Jake and I offer throughout the year is the Military Horse Sense. In fact, that course, one of our um, classes is closing tonight and we're starting another one in September. We'll have another one starting up in September, but it's an online course designed to help folks who don't know anything about working with the military how to work with the military and first responders, be culturally competent, uh, and to integrate equine assisted therapy and learning uh, into that. So Fantastic. those are the two online courses that we offer, but they're, they're live, they're Zoom courses. Um, they're, the content is just, it's ever changing. So I, I wish, to, actually I don't wish that I lived in a field where I could can a course and then just keep rolling it out without much change um, because I'd be bored. Right. I was going to say, that seems really boring to me. I mean, even if a person has like modules and then you get to check in in some way, like at the end of the module to be able to dialogue and um, clear any residual confusions or some, you know, some sort of engagement. It's just like, if you're just hitting multiple choice, like questionnaires. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it, there, are, there are, there are, there um, are ideas that lend themselves to more of that kind of course. And I, I, keep saying I'm going to sit down and, and develop one of them and, and then uh, and then something else catches my attention. <laughs> what? That, that's crazy. It's like, <laughs> yeah, it's interesting because, you know, with multiple intelligence theory and whatnot, I mean, some intelligence styles they got canned course would, would work for um, yeah. because it's not like anybody's right or wrong. It's just what works for an individual. And I think with different like we're we're older now and with the younger kids that are so used to like being on the computer and doing things like maybe it would um it would work a little bit better for them just because they're so accustomed to being online um but I think it's really important to be able to engage with people and just get that feedback yeah we're just on our computers and our phones a little too much as it is which is what another reason why working with horses is great and getting to learn yeah. nonverbal communication because so many people like just don't we're not accustomed to reading the nonverbal communication from each other anymore because we're stuck in our phones and understanding that so much conflict can be cut off ahead of time just by being able to recognize the energy shifts and the other like literal physical representations of nonverbal communication and we're all getting much better at reading smiling eyes. That's true. <laughs> oh, that's 
funny. Well, Shannon, I want to honor your time and we're getting close to the hour. So thank you so very much for taking the time and going in depth. It's been a fantastic interview and I look forward to getting to talk more with you in the future and getting to be on the Zoom calls. Indeed. Thank you, Alicia, for the work that you're doing and for the clients that you will impact and the work that you will do. I appreciate that. All right, my friend, you have a wonderful day. Thank you. Bye. Bye.